Hey guys, and welcome to week 8 of discussions. So today we are going to be talking about decision networks and hidden Markov models. So let's start with decision networks. Alright, uh, so here is what the standard decision network looks like. Hopefully this looks familiar to all of you guys from lecture. So this decision network has basically three components. The first component is going to be this V here. And this is going to be our decision node. So we get to decide what we want to do for V. So down here, we have just some standard base net. I've included a base net with just two nodes, C and V. But in general, you can have uh, kind of any kind of complex base net, whatever you want. And in this base net, some of the nodes will be observed. So for example, B is observed here. And those will serve as kind of evidence for our decision. And then finally, on the right, we have our utility node. So the utility node is going to depend on the decision that we choose and some kind of uncertain outcome uh, that comes from the base net. Right? So our goal is to be able to pick the action that's going to maximize our utility. So that's going to be the challenge here. All right, let's see how we do that. So decision networks are very simple. Uh, basically, all you really need to remember is some set of equations that is going to help you calculate the utilities. Okay, uh, so starting off, our basic unit is going to be these expected utilities. So this is exactly what it sounds like. For example, here, if we wanted to calculate the expected utility of taking action plus V, what that would be is just kind of a weighted average over the outcomes of C times the utility of V and C. Okay, um, so this is saying we fix plus V because that's the action that we take in our utilities table and then we average over the outcomes of C to get what we expect our utility to be. Alright, very straightforward. You can also write something like this where we have a plus B behind the conditioning bar and what this plus B is for our decision network is evidence, right? So what this plus B is saying is that we get to observe this base net node B and after observing this node well, hopefully from B, we'll learn something about C, and that can help us make better decisions. So in this case, now we're taking the weighted average over probability of C given plus B, because we've observed plus B as evidence. All right, so that's expected utility. After that, we have this concept of maximum expected utility. Also, exactly what it sounds like is we're just going to be maxing over the different actions for V that we can take times the expected utility of V. Um, when we write maximum expected utility, we're going to write it in terms of the evidence that we're given. So here we have a null set, which means we, we are given no evidence, uh, which means we just calculated the expected utility of B given no evidence. Uh, if we were given evidence, say we were given plus B, well then this would just be the maximum expected utility with evidence plus B, and that's just equal to the same expression. We're just maxing over the same thing, except now we're maxing over the expected utility of, e, of V, given plus b. We have one final kind of expression that we can have. Uh, so when we write maximum expected utility of capital B, basically what that means is we want to find the expected maximum expected utility of observing this variable b. Okay, so It's going to be a weighted average over the maximum expected utility of all instantiations of b. Right, so these three equations above, right here, I kind of tailored specifically to our decision network on the right. In general, we're going to write expressions that look more like this. Okay, So you have the maximum expected utility of some set of evidence, E1 through En. And so it's going to be the maximum B of the expected utility of B given all that evidence. When we have E1 through En and some E that we haven't observed yet, what this is saying is what we expect our maximum expected utility to be after we observe this variable E. And again, that's just going to be kind of a weighted average over the outcomes of E, uh, given all this other evidence, times the maximum expected utility of that instantiation of E. After that, there's one more quantity that we want, and that's the value of perfect information, the VPI. So the value of perfect information is going to tell us how much we are willing to pay to be able to observe 
some new variable e prime. So here we want to calculate the value of observing some variable e prime given that we've already observed the evidence e. Okay, uh, and what that is going to equal is kind of the m maximum expected utility of e comma e prime. So remember this expression is what we expect our maximum expected utility to be after observing e prime minus what our maximum expected utility is from just observing e. Okay, uh, so basically this quantity on the right here is just how much we expect our maximum expected utility to grow after observing e prime. Okay, uh, so these equations are more or less all you really need to know about decision networks. And if you kind of understand these and know how to use them, then you're in good shape. But there was one last thing I want to talk about with decision networks. So here I have kind of a different decision network on the side where we have A, B, and C in our base net. And now we want to calculate the value of perfect information after observing A. All right. So normally the way you would do this is uh, you would go back and use this bottom equation here. You would calculate the maximum expected utility after observing A versus before and so on. And there's a lot of calculations. But if we look at the structure of the base net, what we can see is because we have kind of a common effect triple here, we have A is independent of C. right? Without observing anything else, A is going to be independent of C. Uh, where And C is kind of the base net node that's going to influence our utility. Right, so what do we know when we know that A is independent of C? We know the probability of C given A is the same as probability of C by the definition of independence. And, and what that tells you is that observing A is not going to give you any more information about C. right? Or in other words, it's, it's not going to affect the utility because it's not going to change the distribution of C. All right, so without doing any calculations, we can tell that VPI of A is 0 just because A and C are independent. All right. Let's move on to talking about hidden Markov models. So we're kind of shifting gears here, um, away from decision networks, to talk about the second topic. So what is a hidden Markov model? Well, it's basically just a special kind of base net that has this structure here, where we have a series of variables, x sub 1, x sub 2, and so on. And then we have a series of evidence variables where each x sub i has a corresponding evidence node e sub i. All right, and uh, you can think of this as kind of encoding the passage of time, right? So the canonical example is on the top with our x's, we have the weather for the day. And then on the bottom for our evidence, we have kind of what the forecast is, right? So if you hear the forecast, over multiple days, you can kind of build a good understanding of what the weather is for that day, even though it's, it's kind of noisy and the distribution is not perfect. So there's a couple of things that are important for our formulation for HMMs, which correspond to the conditional probability tables here on the right. Okay, so the first thing is our initial distribution, P of X sub 1. So that's just going to be the CPT for this phase net here. We're going to have our transitions, the probability of x at time t given x at time t minus 1. And that's going to encode the passage of time here. And it's going to be the same for any two nodes, x sub i and x sub i plus 1. Okay, So the transition from x1 to x2 is going to be the same as the transition from x2 to x3, and so on. We're just going to be using one table for that. All right? uh, and then we're going to have another table for emissions, which is the probability of E given X, and those are going to be the same across every time step as well. Uh, now using these three tables, our goal is then going to be to calculate our probability at some time T given all of the evidence from time 1 to time T. And another way that we'll write this is B of X sub T and this B just stands for the belief. So the challenge is just going to be learning how to track this distribution. So let's figure out how to do that. 
So here is the algorithm that we're going to be using. We're going to, it's called the forward algorithm, and there's kind of two components of it. So we have an elapsed time stage where we're going to calculate the transition from one time step to the next. Basically, we want to calculate the distribution p of x at time t plus 1, given all the evidence from time 1 to time t. So not including the evidence at time t plus 1. Uh, sorry about this notation, this t should be a subscript here for the x, uh, like it appears right here. Uh, but basically, it's just going to be the sum over x sub t of the probability of x sub t plus 1, comma x sub t, given e1 through t. Okay. And so we can split this up into the probability of x of t plus 1 given xt times the probability of xt given e1 through t. So you might say that we're missing an e1 through t after the conditioning bar for this probability table. But because of the special structure of our base net, what we can say is that x of t plus 1, so say x3, is going to be independent of all previous evidence nodes given x2. Right, so x3 is independent of e2 given x2, and x3 is independent of e1 given x2. Okay, so that's why in this first expression here, we can drop the evidence behind the conditioning bar and just simply write it like this. Okay, so what do we notice about this equation here? Well, the first thing you notice is the second expression, probability of xt given e1 through t. This is just our belief at time t. And here, probability of xt plus 1 given xt, well, this is just our elapsed time distribution, right? So this is just the distribution from x1 to x2 or x2 to x3, which we're also given. Okay, so we can easily figure out this new expression, xt plus 1 given e1 through t from what we already have. <clears throat> and we'll write it concisely like this. So recall that b of xt is the same thing as p of xt given evidence 1 through t. And then this is our elapsed time distribution. We'll call this new value b prime of xt plus 1. b prime because we haven't included the evidence from time t plus 1. Now on to the second part which is going to be our observation step. So this is going to be the step where we include the evidence from time t plus 1 into what we had before. So the first thing we'll say is that this expression is proportional to this expression. right? And the only thing that's different between these two expressions is that we have an e sub t plus 1 on the right hand side. right? Uh, and we can say it's proportional because e sub t plus 1 is observed. And to get from one side to the other, basically we're just going to be dividing the right-hand side by the probability of e sub t plus 1 given all the previous evidence. And that's just going to normalize this distribution into what we want to get on the left. So we'll just say, for simplicity's sake, we'll just say that they're proportional and we won't actually show the math here. So from there, we can also, we can also split this expression here, this expression on the right-hand side up into two different probability tables. The first of which is probability of e t plus 1 given x t plus 1. And the second one is probability of x t plus 1 given e1 through t. Okay, so again, we're making a conditional independence assumption here where we, we're saying that e at time t plus 1 is going to be independent of all other evidence given x at time t plus 1. Okay. Um, so basically what that's saying is if we're just using this concrete example on the base net here, we're saying that e sub 3 is going to be independent of e2 given x3. And you can verify that that's the case. So we're making the assumption here. So what does this simplify into? So if we look at our two quantities more closely, we'll see that this first quantity, probability of e at time t plus 1 given x at time t plus 1, this is just our evidence table that we're given in our HMM formulation. So that's just going to be the table probability of E given X. And the second expression here, probability of X at time T plus 1 given E from time 1 to time T. Well, that's exactly what we calculated here in elapsed time, right? So this is what we call our B prime 
of x sub t plus 1. Okay, so if we were going to rewrite this expression in terms of our b's, it would look something like this. Right, so the belief of x at time t plus 1 is proportional to the probability of e at time t plus 1 given x at time t plus 1, so this is just the evidence probability table times our b prime that we calculated here. Alright, and that's basically all there is to it. So the forward algorithm is just going to be a recursive way uh, to track our distribution of x as we move through time. So this is analogous to the exact inference that we had on base nets, where we're finding the exact probability distribution of x at time t, <coughs> given the evidence. But, of course, that's not always going to be practical if our tables get too big, which is why we also have this concept of particle filtering. Okay, And you can think of particle filtering for HMMs basically uh, like what sampling was for base nets. Right? Um, it's just a way to approximately keep track of the distribution without making expensive computations. Okay, so let's see how we do this. So, for elapsed time, this is how we're going to model moving from x1 to x2. So for each sample, we're going to be getting a new sample, x prime, and we're going to get that from the distribution of the probability of x prime given x. Okay. Uh, so this distribution is the probability of x at time t plus 1 given x at time t. It's just our elapsed time distribution. And this is going to model moving from one time step to the next. To model the observation update, this uh, step is a little trickier. So the first thing to do is we're going to weight all samples x by the probability that we receive the we see the evidence at that time step given what our sample value is. So all of these samples would be assigned some kind of weight. <clears throat> and then in the second step, we'll resample now from our weighted distribution w of x. Okay. Uh, so of course these weights aren't all going to sum to 1, so we're going to have to do some work to normalize this weighted distribution so that we can sample from it. But this is how we're going to apply the observation step. Right? So we're going to be creating new samples from the weighted distribution. And that's basically all there is to particle filtering. Okay, um, so that basically wraps it up for this week. I know I went through all this stuff a little fast, but basically for both hidden Markov models and decision networks, you're really just interested in some set of equations and learning how to apply those equations. Um, so I definitely encourage you to try out some simple problems, work on the homework, and make sure that you really understand how to use these equations. And if you can understand where all the equations fit and how to use all of them, then I would say that you're in pretty good shape. All right, so good luck on the homework, and I will see you guys next week.